So welcome everybody to this uh, track about uh, embedded Qt. And first out will be Linda Campbell from Qnix, or Qnix, how you pronounce it? Qnix, okay. And uh, according to her, she's been working in this company for 25 years, and I expect she has bigger experience than almost anybody. <laughs> I let her do the detailed interaction herself, yeah. and uh, please welcome Linda Campbell. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, I was just commenting to my colleague, Grant, who's the director of product management at Cunix, that my laptop's a bit of false advertising because it might imply that I'm a technical person, but I'm not at all, which you'll clearly figure out shortly as I present. So um, I do business development with uh, partnerships around our automotive platform. I'm um, pretty much an outbound evangelist. I spent a lot of time talking to companies who are trying to get into automotive, a lot of them coming from the mobile space, especially since we've been part of BlackBerry and that development community. And um, what I wanted to do was sort of um, give you guys the insight that I um, try to share to developers um, when, it, when they approach me about automotive, because it is a very um, difficult market. Um, I like to say that um, doing businesses in automotive is like having a really ugly baby. Um, you know, it's an ugly baby, it's not pretty, but you still, you, you can't help but love it. And so we do love our customers and our business in automotive, but it is not without its challenges. So um, it's with that background that I'll be um, giving the talk. Um, okay, so so what I'm going to do really quickly, um, how many of you were in the keynote this morning that our fabulous CEO did? Anybody? Okay, wasn't he awesome? Yes. He's not in here, so I'm not actually doing that for brownie points. Um, but uh, it's always a great treat to get to listen to him talk because he's been in this industry for such a long time and is truly passionate about technology. Um, so I won't spend too much time on who we are, but be, since, since you got a chance to hear him this morning, um, but I will do a, a quick overview. I'm going to talk about the market and um, what, what we see with apps and some of the challenges and why we think a developer community matters and what the you know, overall opportunity is for you guys. Um, so the first thing about Cunix is um, the company's been around since 1980 and um, we've, we were a privately held, organically grown company for up until I think it was about 2004 when we were acquired by Harman. And, um, and before I talk about Harman and BlackBerry, I'll just make the comment that we're sold on a global basis and we're sold into lots of different markets. So you might have got the impression from the session this morning, um, we're in automotive, we're in, um, we're in smartphones, we're in a lot of industrial and robotics applications, we're in a lot of machine to machine and um, a, really a wide variety, medical instrumentation, military, aerospace and whatnot. Um, but the big advantage for us of, um, of our background is that being part of Harman um, for five or six years was this awesome experience because we got to grow our business in automotive. We were selling to all of their competitors, but we were part of an automotive tier one supplier. And being on the inside is always quite a bit different than having a supplier uh, customer relationship. And so we gained a level of experience working with our, our colleagues at Harman that wouldn't have been possible if we were an external company. So we really got firsthand insight in helping a tier one get their um, customers, who are the car companies, their projects to market on time. Um, and then when Harman sold us to BlackBerry, it was like the perfect marriage because really um, automotive and um, mobile are two converging markets and um, uh, in lots of different ways. They're converging from a technology perspective, they're converging from a customer experience perspective. So this again was giving us the inside scoop on how things work in the smartphone space was really to our advantage as well. Um, the, the, the product and everything we do is all centered around this Cunix technology, the operating system platform itself. And I'm not going to go into any great detail on it, but um, one of the sort of main differentiators for us is that we're the best of two worlds because we're a microkernel, real-time, highly performant, um, reliable, scalable platform. 
Um, and we compete with a whole set of companies that do uh, real-time systems like that. And then on the other hand, we're, we've got all the full um, bells and whistles of a real operating system, um, including a lot of UX and multimedia technologies. We've got a lot of industry certifications and um, compliance to standards. So we combine the, uh, the real-time and then the full features that you'd expect with a regular operating system into a single platform. Um, there's a lot of companies using Cunix outside of automotive. I mentioned some of them um, earlier, but basically we're used in anything from a standalone system to a fully network distributed system like um, the Cisco routers that Dan described in his keynote this morning. And we're also used in really embedded headless devices right up to um, systems that have really immersive user interfaces. and um, that we, we are used in everything from the, the um, robot that controls the Canada arm on the space shuttle to casino gaming machines uh, to software-defined radios for military equipment. So really quite a wide um, breadth of experience. But the focus today is automotive. And um, again, just trying to tell you um, from a business perspective everything we know about this marketplace. So. Um, Cunix is being deployed by over 40 um, car companies and over 40 million vehicles, 250 vehicle platforms. Um, some of the brands that you might recognize, um, the Audi MMI 3G, if you've seen um, their Google Earth system running in, um, in some of the latest high-end Audis, those are all Cunix-based systems. Um, we are also in the Toyota Entune, GM OnStar, every OnStar system on the road is based on Cunix, so we have uh, quite a good track record in this space. Okay, so now I'm going to start talking about the market and um, for just, again, trying to give you some insight into what it's like doing business in this space, and you can decide if it's, um, if it's going to be easy or hard and whether you're interested in going there or not. Um, the, the first thing is I've got a glossary of terms here because um, when we first started in automotive, which um, was in 1999, uh, so we've been at automotive for 15 years now, um, it, it actually took a little while to understand how everything worked. And I also have a value chain that I'll show you here in a second um, to, to further describe it. But we all collectively call the, OE, the car makers are the OEMs. And then their suppliers are the tier one suppliers. And then companies like Cunix and Freescale and Qualcomm, we're all um, tier two suppliers. So we provide technology to the tier ones who are our customers. And they're the ones who build fully integrated um, systems for the, um, for the car companies themselves. Um, there is a process that I also have some slides on this, but RFI, RFQ, RFP, those are not um, expressions that are necessarily new, but they have a, a uh, they're used a lot in the automotive space because the OEMs, that's how they go out and get bids for projects from the tier one suppliers. And they, they engage with a whole bunch of companies all at once to try and figure out what the best um, solution will be for their project. Um, there's another expression called SOP, which stands for start of production. And this is in general when um, the technology is hitting the manufacturing line as part of a car. And um, I mean, the only thing you really need to know about SOP is you never want to be the guy that is standing between it and the date that it's going to happen, because that's really bad. Um, the head unit or centered stack, that's a term that originally came from um, just referencing the audio system in the car, but now it's come to really refer, refer to the um, onboard computing system in the car. So we that's, again, people talk about it like that, head unit, center stack. And infotainment is a word, I think, that comes specifically from this market, and it means information and entertainment merged together, which generally we use it to refer to the high-end systems more than, um, more than other ones. And then there's a value chain here, um, which shows basically how the uh, flow of the OEM, the tier one, and then the various tier two suppliers. This is not comprehensive. I just am using it as an example. So all of the companies like um, silicon vendors, board vendors, tool vendors, um, companies like Cunix, we're um, at the bottom of the, the chain feeding up. But there's a lot of things happening in the um, industry now as far as um, shifts in that value chain, which I'll talk about in a minute as well. Um, OK, so 
in general, this is how um, the industry talks about connectivity. Uh, we talked about the brought-in experience, the built-in experience, and then just the beamed-in experience, referring to the fact that you're connected to the um, internet or the cloud. And I think Dan did a good job this morning um, uh, describing this. Um, and and one of the things to think about with it is that brought in used to refer to um, bringing your phone into the car and having a really good hands-free experience or perhaps using the phone um, for the, your data plan to connect to the internet. It's really uh, changing now. Um, more and more, we're thinking of the brought-in experience and the built-in experience, which is the head unit, as um, being a um, hybrid experience because consumers want to be able to bring the devices they own and are in their pockets into the car with them and be able to have a, a common experience from their smartphone, whether they're outside of the car or inside of the car. Um, but the car systems, like the bigger screen, the audio system and whatnot, offer a lot of uh, physical real estate that can be uh, a benefit for um, how you experience those that content and applications in a different environment. Um, but with connectivity, there's been a big change for everybody in the industry. So um, companies like Cunix and the Tier 1 suppliers and the OEMs, before everything got connected, um, the, the embedded ecosystem was all we really had to worry about. So there was operating system companies, there was silicon companies building hardware, um, there was middleware like voice engines and nav engines, and then the Tier 1 suppliers and the OEMs would write custom applications, and the systems that popped out were basically closed, standalone, disconnected um, systems. Now with um, cloud connectivity, we see these other ecosystems coming into the um, into the mix, like the mobile ecosystem, which isn't just the smartphone vendors themselves, like um, the Androids and Samsungs and Apples and Blackberries of the world, but also the app developer communities that are all very interested in how they can extend their application experience into automotive. Um, the carrier ecosystem is also uh, quite interested in automotive because um, a lot of people are talking about how the smartphone market, the hockey stick growth that was taking place for so long is starting to flatten out and that the, the carriers and other um, suppliers are looking for new opportunities to sell data and services um, that go along with that data. So we we see companies like AT&T and Deutsche Telekom and those types of companies um, getting very interested in automotive. And then there's also the IT ecosystem. And this really, um, that it's a little bit newer. And this is uh, happening now because originally when we thought of the connected car, I think most people thought of it in terms of connected drivers, which is what we always think about is, as a driver, how am I going to experience my content in the internet and how am I going to be you know, have access to location-based services and whatnot while I'm driving. Um, but the reality is that there's also this notion of the car itself. And the car is a collection of sensors that are picking up information um, about the car itself, about their environment. And there's a lot of companies like IBM and SAP and, and companies like that that are really interested in how they can help sell big data services to the car companies and other related industries in order to uh, really take advantage of all of the information a car is collecting ab about itself and, and the, the uh, new level of business that can be generated as a result. OK, so this is a picture of the OEM um, development cycle. Um, so it starts with um, research, prototyping, and product planning that happens in the, the labs, a lot of the car companies have labs in um, uh, California, um, in uh, around Palo Alto and San Francisco and Redwood City. Um, and so they do a lot of their uh, prototyping there. And then what happens is they'll um, use that product planning phase to write their request for proposal, request for quote. And then they start this engagement process with all the tier one suppliers. Um, and that's a really interesting time for a company like Cunix. Um, and, and I'm saying this because as developers who might end up um, supporting customers in this space, it's important for you to understand. Because we'll literally be supporting the OEM themselves. So, like, so for example, a company like GM might have a big RFI out. 
But then we're also supporting all of the silicon vendors who are bidding on that business as well, and all of the tier one suppliers who've elected to bid their proposal on Cunix. And so we're basically p playing, um, uh, I was going to say Russian roulette, but that's kind of a negative expression. But I mean, we're basically supporting all of the different companies as they try and win the business. So, and at the end of the day, we still only have one customer. So it's not, um, it's, 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 it's kind of an expensive way to do business, but we do it anyways. Um, so eventually the contract is awarded and then we start the development process and um, we start a production and production. And I, I have another slide in a minute that will show you um, where software kind of gets delivered in that process. And again, historically, this was a really long cycle. Three years was not unheard of. And now um, the companies are trying to get it down to closer to 12 months. But when you compare that to development cycles for other types of products, it's still quite long. Um, and meanwhile, so as their, um, their development cycles are shrinking, all of our customers um, are having to, the software that they're building is becoming increasingly complex and the systems themselves are much more fully featured. And so they've got this, this, this time crunch of how long it takes um, to get a product to market. But at the same time, they're having to add lots and lots of um, um, new capabilities. And that has a direct impact on a company like Cunix as well. We've had to really invest in a lot of new technologies to support them. Um, OK, so this is another um, slide that just gives you a view of um, the, how the software deliverable um, process works. And I, I borrowed this from one of our um, product managers who looks after Cunix Car. Um, I'm not going to be talking about our products specifically today. I think, Grant, you're going to have some content on that tomorrow, right? So anybody who's interested after this presentation and learning more about our products specifically can go see Grant tomorrow. Um, but the main thing to understand is that um, the technology that we go to market with in automotive is called Cunix Car. And uh, basically, our customers are the tier one suppliers. They get subscriptions to that. And so do the OEMs. So we've got them all running on the same um, software platform, which is always evolving and being en enhanced. So during the uh, prototyping phase, when the OEM is trying to decide um, you know, what their requirements document are, is going to look like, Cunix is spending a lot of time influencing those companies. We, uh, we have special programs to look after them, make sure we're, we, we sponsor their development, we seed them with development um, tools and technology, because we're really trying to get them to do a directed buy where they mandate or request that the tier ones provide a solution based on Cunix. Um, and a, as I mentioned earlier, at the same time, we're de delivering software to the um, tier one suppliers. And then, and, and it just keeps iterating that way. And then when the contract is awarded, we'll be working with fewer companies, although it should be noted that sometimes, and actually quite often, um, an OEM will award a, pr a, a program to two companies um, and and those, because they they're they're play, placing bets, they don't want to give one one supplier all the business, so they'll split it between two. And so we'll often be working with two different companies building essentially the same system, but slightly differently. And um, then during that whole development phase, we're constantly um, providing them with new software, and then eventually. Um, at, as we see them go into production um, and with new technologies like over-the-air software updates and stuff, um, we'll be able to keep the software fresh and be delivering them new technology on an ongoing basis. So one of the challenges um, the automakers have is actually um, the the development life cycle as well as the product life cycle. So what I've been talking about mostly here has been so far has been the development life cycle. So now if we look at the product life cycle, if you think about a car, they at, at start of production time from then on, that car is going to live often 10 years, you know, like, I mean, they're, the cars have a very long time in market. Um, and meanwhile, um, you can compare that to a consumer electronics device, which will 
you know, usually have maximum two-year lifetime. I think um, people, companies like uh, Apple and um, um, BlackBerry and Samsung would love to see us change our smartphones every year if, if they could. Um, so there's this ongoing churn of consumer electronics technologies, and then applications even have a shorter life cycle. So when you think about being a car company and trying to um, build systems that are relevant to consumers and current and up to date, they really they they really struggle with just the the fact that they built these. At the end of the day, even though it's an infotainment system, it's built into this thing that's a car and it's a big piece of metal on four wheels that's going to be around for a long time. Um, so they they struggle with technology life cycles, um, obsolescence, and the relevance of what they're doing. Um, the other thing to point out is that the um, the car companies um, and I have more on this later, but they're there's really no standard platform for things. So it's a highly fragmented market, even from a hardware perspective. Um, so what they're, we're seeing more and more, and, and this relates to uh, Qt as a business, is that the car companies are relying on the mobile, like innovation that happens in the mobile industry, they're relying on that and bringing it in to the automotive market. So like this silicon that gets designed for a smartphone is what gets adopted and modified and is hardened for um, delivery into an automotive application. So that's another reason why it's, it's again, the marriage between being part of a smartphone company and having all that experience as a Harman company has really been beneficial to us. So now talking a little bit about some of the um, changes that we see in the supply chain. So um, I think in the old days, the way it worked is that the OEMs and the tier ones, like the OEMs would write up their specification. Um, it would be like several hundreds of thousands of pages and then they would deliver it to the tier one and the tier one would go away and build it exactly as specified and anything that went wrong there were like um, penalties and um, financial consideration that changed hands. Um, but I think in, in that model the OEMs were really kind of hands off about the technology and uh, let the uh, tier one suppliers really make their own decisions about um, what they would provide to fulfill on the requirements. That's really, really changing over the last um, three to five years where the, the car companies are really taking a very specific and direct interest in what goes into their cars and they're doing a lot of the development themselves um, and they're starting to do these directed buys and have really strong mandates about what, what they're willing um, to accept from the tier one. And I, I think um, you see this, they, they see that software is definitely a differentiator for them and that's just um, an ongoing thing that we see all of them now have a presence like in Silicon Valley with their software labs and um, company like BMW has, um, they have I think four global um, development centers purely around helping get third-party content software into their um, platform. I know they have one in the States, one in Germany, um, one in, um, I think, one in Japan and one in Singapore, China. There's two in APAC. Mm -hmm. Pardon? Shanghai. Okay, Shanghai. Okay, thank you. Um, and the other thing I was going to mention is that there's these changing models for engagement. So um, Audi actually uh, did a partnership with a company called Electrobit and formed a company called eSolutions, which is really, um, it's like a, a tier one software only um, provider. So what they do is they work with eSolutions and Audi is partial owner, Electrobit's Electrobit's partial owner, they do the software development and then the tier one who, who historically would have done that is now getting the software from eSolutions and they're doing more of the hardware development and system integration. So that's a completely new model. Another example is um, what Tesla has been doing, which is they haven't worked with any tier one suppliers. They're doing everything themselves, which again is quite um, an unusual approach. So basically, things are changing. Um, but one thing that's true is that, um, and I actually, I'm going to, 
I was talking, I, I got this from a car company just last week, and he said the biggest challenge they have is that their history as, as metal benders, and it's kind of pervasive throughout the organization. Like when they talk about um, licensing software and software technology in general, um, they're legal people. They don't have legal people who understand IP and and what the right models are for that, and um, and and they're extremely far more paranoid, for example, than a than a, a company like Tesla is, who's new to it and comes at it as a high tech company as opposed to coming at it as an auto manufacturer. Um, they also have historically had very um, negative relationships with their tier one suppliers. It's a very old school engagement model. Um, and the tier ones historically had all this control over the systems, but um, now they're trying to rethink what their strategies are as companies like Audi basically take you know, value out of what they have historically built for them. Um, so they're trying to develop new value propositions and they're also under major pressure to reduce their costs because again, um, I don't know about what it's like here in Germany, but you know, you can buy um, a smartphone which is usually um, way more uh, up-to-date technology, say, let's just say $500, but if you go into a, a car dealership and you want to buy the high-end infotainment system for your car, it's probably going to be a $1,500 to $2,000 option. So as consumers, there's a big price discrepancy. And meanwhile, there's a whole bunch of companies that are coming into this space and we're you know, we're watching to see what companies like Android and Apple are going to do there. Um, there's social networking brands and the carriers are are, um, are getting involved. And I already mentioned some of the big data people. So there's a it's it's an awesome time in automotive to get into the market because there's so much change happening. Happening, I think it's a, it's an ideal time for new entrants. Um, so the other thing that the uh, car companies are challenged by is um, just this a aspect of driver distraction. Um, I heard actually, um, I just read a blog that one of my colleagues wrote um, in the last week, and that in in Ontario um, last last month or last year, I think it was, um, there was. For the first time on record, more accidents caused by driver distraction than impaired driving. So it's really becoming a huge problem. They compare um, uh, they compare texting while driving to drunk driving in most research studies. And what we're seeing is there's a lot of legislation happening um, at the state and federal levels um, to sort of manage how we use um, uh, use our handsets in cars. And so the executive summary on this is that the OEMs um, today are on the hook for anything that's built into the vehicle. So if anything, like that's why aftermarket is very different because if as a consumer you go and you buy a device and put it into your car, that's, that's your decision as a consumer. But if the car company has built something in and um, it, it's a distracting system that causes ac accidents, that's their responsibility. Um, so they're very they're very focused on solving this problem um, uh, carefully, and and they're also working. They want to be in control of their own destiny. So it's not just that they're um, like they're, they have real business interests in in trying to help work with the government and the industry to make sure that they build safe systems so that they don't end up getting um, all of this technology mandated right out of the car. Um, and one other thing to keep in in perspective in all of this is um, what what consumers expect. Um, and I think all of us now have most, I'm sure everybody here has a smartphone and your experience and relationship with that smartphone really has changed what you expect out of systems that you engage with. Um, <clears throat> I don't know about you, but every time I walk up to a screen now, I try to touch it, you know, and when it doesn't respond, it's really annoying, you know, and you're like pinching and dragging and all that kind of stuff. So you, as consumers, we're being trained by our smartphones about how we want to interact with the systems that are built into our cars. Uh, we want to be able to access all of our content every time, anytime, anywhere. We want the latest state-of-the-art electronics and, we, you know, we want things to be familiar. We don't want to have a different experience with every system that we interact with. So those are some of the, those are real challenges that the car companies have to figure out because um, I think, 
you know, Dan also made this comment about the possibility of taking a smartphone and using it on the dashboard of a car. And one of the challenges the car companies have is finding a bracket that's universal. And and that's I thought that was a good point to make just about how fragmented all of our experiences are because there are so many different types of phones and whatnot that we can interact with. Um, and then the other thing is just to make this point a little bit uh, further is that there's this desire to um, integrate our mobile experiences in the car. So at first it was just how do we connect our phones? Now it's how do we bring our apps and our content with us? And again, the, um, the car companies have the challenge of um, not just the life cycle disparity between a smartphone and a car, um, but also the lack of standards. So right now, if you're a car company, um, you have to do one technology to connect to an Apple iPod, another technology to connect to a Samsung device, another technology to connect to a BlackBerry device, and there's a huge number of things for them to consider. So it, this, this is, a, um, again, a, an area where I think what, um, what Dan presented with GLCast this morning is hopefully something that we'll be able to bring to the market to help alleviate some of the, the pain around this. Um, the other thing is application stores. So how do we get um, applications to market? So you're, you guys are developers. Um, you have apps that you want to um, bring to automotive. First of all, if you can <clears throat> find the right people to talk to at the OEM or the tier one supplier or companies like us, um, how are you going to actually um, get your, your product to market? Because they're like the, um, the car companies are very interested in app stores, and, and I think some of them even have this notion that they'll build their own um, app stores, but a lot uh, we don't actually think that that's going to be a successful strategy for most of them because it doesn't really follow what consumers expect. So we really think it's better if consumers can go to get automotive apps from the app stores of their uh, the phone companies that they're dealing with, um, like where they would normally go to get their applications. Um, but applications um, are really interesting to the car companies because they see it as a way of ex extending the lifespan of their vehicle because if they can deliver new content in the form of applications to their customers, that's great. They can build brand loyalty with it. It allows them to make it possible for their customers to personalize the driving experience. Um, but there is also this notion that they will need to certify things and validate what they're providing to customers. And then um, th my last point about sort of what's going on in the market right now is there's an awful lot of talk about autonomous cars and a lot of research going on in here in this area. And um, it really, it's, it's, I think it's kind of an interesting subject to think about what will be the experience as a consumer in a vehicle in five to ten years if if it's all about autonomous driving because then we'll actually be able to bring in whatever systems we have um, as far as um, getting you know getting content in okay so just a few um Sorry, is it are you telling me I have 15 minutes to talk, or you want me to do 15 minutes of questions now? No, no, 15 minutes. Okay, okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so um, just talk a little bit about applications specifically. So um, you know, over the last year, there's been a or the last few years, there's been a lot of conversation about what kinds of applications we're going to see in automotive. And again, there was this idea of app stores and you know, would it be, would it replicate the mobile experience? And I think most people um, now in the industry think that it's not a case of apps like you would use it, see in the uh, Apple or um, Google stores. It's not 30,000 apps. Driver distraction is a real issue. And also the fact that OEMs need to validate applications. So it's really a question of apps that are more focused and relevant to the driving experience. So location-based services, navigation, information that's relevant to where you are and what you're doing. Um, and eventually, I think there will be applications that get developed around the notion of the connected car versus the connected driver, but they probably aren't going to be apps that are, um, uh, th they'll probably be apps that are being built and not for other industries other than consumers themselves. One of the challenge with um, applications is that automotive isn't really a big enough market on its own to have a dedicated um, 
a developer community. So we really rely on leveraging what's happening in in the mobile space, which is why um, uh, Digia's efforts to bring Qt to other platforms like IO, uh, like the iPhone and um, Android, is great for us because for everybody in automotive because we hope that we'll see way more cute development happening in the mobile space and that will be good for everybody in automotive. Um, the automotive market is also very different. Like it's, it's, it's kind of interesting to watch the smartphone space because, you know, um, watching what companies like um, BlackBerry and uh, Nokia have, have gone through in order to try and attract a developer community because they're competing with the Apple and Android um, platforms for developer mindshare. Well, so you, you take the pool of developers and you think you have Apple and Android as uh, the leading platforms for smartphones, which are very high volume, and then you take the next level of smartphone vendors and then you take automotive and, and automotive every right now, it's a completely fragmented market, even though, and I have a slide that shows a bunch of Cunix systems, but all of them, even though they're all using Cunix, it's a highly fragmented market. You could not write an application once and run it on all of those systems. So there's um, a lot of work to do in that respect. Um, and, and I think, that's one of the things we're trying to do with our Cunix car platform and with alliances with companies, um, with, with technologies like Qt, is try and help create a platform that people can, can um, deploy across the board. Uh, this is that example that I was going to say. The, um, I, I used to do this slide and I would have a picture of a bunch of snowflakes on the left instead of these three um, customer systems. But the point is that all of these um, systems on the right are all based on Cunix, but they're all completely different. So it's just, again, a nature of the embedded space. And it's something that as an industry we're working on, but it, I think it is also um, one of the reasons why we believe that's, um, that the smartphone and that technology is going to become more important for applications in the car. And this is another slide that one of my colleagues did just joking around about um, do, like doing some um, you know paper back of the paper napkin math on applications and and revenue he um, he said let's just take a sample application price of a dollar an app um, if you take the number of iPhones that were sold in one quarter in 2012 it was 37 million so he's making this you know the the total potential revenue you could make is um, 37 million dollars and then um, if you took that number and you wanted to try and make the same amount of money in automotive um, in all of 2012 um, Toyota sold um, 344,000 cars and that was their top selling uh, non pickup vehicle in the US um, and so basically in order to make the same amount of money based on um, uh, the number of units, the app that was a dollar would have to be $107. And so clearly this is not the way we're going to price apps in automotive at all. Um, but it, it's just a good, I think it's a cute way of showing um, the difference in the volumes and, um, and the challenges we have collectively as an industry to find business models that are going to work for people. Um, so the fact that all of our OEM customers um, want to differentiate on the basis of their platform just means that only the very biggest app companies can participate in the ecosystem. So one of those companies um, right now, and I don't think they're very pervasive in, in Europe, is Pandora. Um, Pandora is a music streaming music service, and they're highly successful in automotive and they're spending a lot of money to support that market because they see it as an extension of their business and um, so they're able to participate in the market because um, they're funding it through the other parts of their business but the reality is this, this differentiation of the platforms is really hard for everybody trying to target this market. Um, okay, and um, the, uh, this was the, uh, another point, and then I'm going to sw switch into how we are addressing some of the challenges. But um, a lot of the um, OEMs are doing the porting themselves. So right now, it's really hard for an individual developer to do an application port 
by themselves with a car company. Um, and so this model doesn't really work because it doesn't scale. A lot of the OEMs now are trying to create their own um, APIs and SDKs. And I have links at the end of my presentation so you can go find out more about what Ford and GM are doing in this area. Um, but essentially, the, the car companies are very committed to working on this, but they have to do it within the parameters of their business. So they still have the fragmentation um, and they um, have the issues around driver distraction and wanting to be able to validate that the apps that third parties bring into the car are not going to mess about with any of the systems and make the vehicle less safe than it's supposed to be. So, um, just talk, I'm just going to speed it up a bit here, but um, so one of the things we we think is um, as far as trying to standardize on a common platform is that w the first level of standardization should really be at the app framework um, area. So we think that having support for things like Qt and HTML5 with Qnix is really important because it's really less about the um, operating system and more about when you're talking about um, developer applications, about the frameworks that we support. So um, we're also um, working now with, with, with Google on supporting um, Android um, in the car as well. So we're, we're basically looking and saying what, what types of um, app platforms are out there that we should support and um, we're working towards doing those ourselves. Um, we think Qt is really important. Our customers in automotive, and actually this is a mix of Qnix and non-Qnix um, projects, but we're seeing um, really in the last year the amount of customers looking at Qt has really um, taken off. I'm, I, I don't actually know why. I know that, I, I mean, I don't know why because of the timing why suddenly it's happening, but I know that what they like about it is that it's a very flexible, powerful um, platform. It's OS agnostic um, and it's an industry standard. So we, we're really excited about that. We made the right bet um, working with the Qt community. And um, just one other point to make about how you guys can make money. And these slides are going to be available um, after after the event in the US. Um, so you'll be able to see. I just want to talk. There, there's a bunch of ways that app developers make money today based on the mobile space. And I think that in automotive, we're going to have to look at it completely differently. I think most um, app developers are in the short term are going to be funded by the OEMs or they're going to do the work because they see the work that they're going to do in automotive to be an extension of their brand or it's um or it's an extension of the experience that their consumers expect to have their customers expect to have with their product um, we also see um, what i was saying earlier is that the car companies are getting very proactive about um, solving the issue of driver distraction with their SDKs and APIs. Um, and then they're looking to companies like Qnix to provide technology um, that helps them virtualize the environment so that you can actually have your sort of mission critical car applications in one portion of the system and you can allow third party apps to run in another part of the system without, um, you know, um, allowing those third-party apps to interfere with any of the mission-critical um, systems. Um, and also another thing that a lot of companies are investing significantly in now is voice as a uh, primary uh, user interface and how we'll experience our vehicles will be by talking and uh, voice-based systems. And also we're seeing um, a lot of the car companies doing research on heads-up displays and how you'll be able to sort of basically try and keep your eyes off the center unit and more on the road in front of you. So why does a developer community matter? Um, and why do I personally think it's really important? So um, I think that the opportunity in automotive goes far beyond what we see today. And I, that the point that I was trying to make earlier is I really like to differentiate between the connected driver and the connected car. So the connected driver is what everybody talks about today. For the most part, it's location-based services. Um, it's things that make you pro more productive, like you can you know, voice text people or schedule appointments, or your car can tell you you're running late for an appointment because it can read your calendar and send you on a new path. All of that kind of stuff is great. But I think that really, um, 
the fact that cars are going to be connected directly themselves to the cloud um, opens up a whole new opportunity for a lot of different um, secondary industries to automotive, um, like government insurance, rental car companies, um, and services like repairs and gas. And, and for the car companies themselves, having the car connected is going to do a lot to improve their business because not only does it improve customer intimacy, I think most of us have that experience where we buy a car, we drive it off the lot, and you know we don't usually have a relationship with the car company afterwards we might come in for servicing if if they're good at doing regular services or if it's a leased vehicle but even then that's not for sure so the car companies can use the uh, connected driving experience as a way to build brand loyalty and then um, the other point that i want to make is that they're under the gun the, all the time on two issues. One is um, safety and the other one is environmental issues. So once the car's connected and we're analyzing the data that it's produ producing, we can start like, imagine if the car companies could detect that a part was gonna fail um, and that could potentially cause an accident before that actually happened. Like they could prevent malfunction because the car was constantly reporting on its health. Or what if um, they get to the point where we can have cameras and whatnot that de de detect whether a driver is falling asleep at the wheel? Or how about how um, we can use traffic um, and collision avoidance? If all the cars are talking to each other and talking to the infrastructure as well, think about how um, traffic management can be improved for a city. Like there's there's tons of potential here, and I think we're just really at the the very um, outset of it. And um, I think it's really good news for cute developers because the, the industry is in such a state of change and, and I would say in some ways turmoil, um, that there's new standards coming about, uh, new technologies, new partnerships that are um, possible. And um, all, of, all of these are really going to be essential for the success of the automotive industry. And I think that with all of that change comes opportunity for um, new participation. And um, the OEMs, as I've said, are embracing Cute. Um, mobile edition, um, you know, referring to the investments Digi is making on cross-platform support, means we're going to um, be um, further enhancing the marriage of mobile and automotive. And um, I think that just essentially, you know, with, there's tons of opportunity here for developers, and the car companies care. They do. They absolutely all of them have programs aimed at developers, or at least many of them are starting to go in that direction. It's just, it's just not as easy as it is in mobile yet. So it's hard, but I think there's a lot of opportunity there, and um, I have some resources here at the end. Um, so there's some shows coming up. There's another show. Um, there's an automotive app show here in Berlin in early December. There's a telematics update show in Munich in November. The biggest automotive show these days from a technology perspective is CES in Las Vegas. Um, there's some links for developer programs that you might want to look at to find out more about what Ford and GM are doing. And then Cunix Car, um, if you're interested in following, we have an auto blog that's a really great way to learn about automotive. And, um, and there's a lot of information on our website about our product as well. So I think I have a few minutes left for questions. Was I right on time? No, right. Oh, I'm like you guys. I'm so almost perfect. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, thank you, Linda. So uh, because we have a recording going on, uh, everybody, especially those who are not here, would be extremely grateful if you asked your question through this mic. So are there any questions? Um, you mentioned this a little bit, that uh, the spot is becoming a little bit tight for OEMs. Um, what do you think? Uh, okay, we didn't even touch about the aftermarket, which is also digging yeah. up, and they don't have the product lifecycle problems. Um, do you, uh, how do you feel? The, isn't there a risk in the future that either OEMs will be out of the box and simply will bring a, a phone into the car, will, which will do all the processing, and the car will be just a glorified display? for our infotainment apps? So, okay, I would answer that in a, a couple different ways. So first of all, I think 
aftermarket is similar to um, what's what's what we see is happening in the rear seat entertainment space, which is those markets I think are going to be displaced by brought in devices like like what Dan described, why you just use a smartphone attached to the front. Um, you can bring your tablet in the rear seat. So I think aftermarket, it's not a market we participate in. And uh, I think it's it was a good idea not to bet on it. But that's just my opinion. Um, as far as what um, I think there will always be, an, I think it's always going to be a hybrid solution where as an individual, you're going to have your smartphone that you want to bring in and you want to be able to render and experience the content from your phone and your life into your car. But I think there's still always going to be systems and applications that make sense that are based on the car and are, you know, come, talking to the CAN bus and whatnot in the vehicle and that um, there will be room for a marriage of, 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 of both of those things. And, and also, this, having this the screen and the real estate that you have in the vehicle is is an as an advantage for you know especially things like your your built-in navigation systems and stuff like that. Okay, sure. Uh, uh, just but just one one question because we are now we are talking about apps created of, uh, outside from OEMs. Now we are talking about the standardized platforms. We, I think we'll hear about this more in the future in a moment. And um, now we are talking that in fact you provide already the hardware and some some support to the producer. So there's in fact not not much value that OEM brings in. So you know what it, I it's an interesting <laughs> question because I, I totally, in some ways, I see your point. And I think that the car companies are in an interesting position because they have to try and protect their brand and the experience, the, you know, I'll use Audi as an example, the Audi driving experience, Audi wants to own that experience. Um, but they're, they're in a very difficult position, I think, as customers, <clears throat> bond with the experiences they have with their smartphones or even like right now I think the brand war or the experience war is between the smartphone and the car but then the next iteration of it might be more about the applications and the the you know the social um, planet that you live in online um, it's it's hard to say I was gonna ask Dan <laughs> yeah <laughs> he snuck in at the uh, <laughs> after my intro <laughs> Some of the more progressive OEMs have realized that um, one of the ways of keeping their relevance is to stop thinking about it as one screen in the car, but think of the car as a cockpit. You slide in, it's multiple screens. There's a digital instrument cluster. There's a heads-up display. There's an infotainment stack. And basically building an environment in which there's data on multiple of those screens, you know, it may be that, you know, you get a little thing in your cluster, your heads-up display saying a text message came in and there's more data on another one. And by building it as a whole, you know, cockpit, um, that's hard to bring in on a single phone, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where you can get the relevant, you know, because who wouldn't want to drop in their car, sink in, and imagine that they're like in a fighter jet, right? And they've got all these screens in front of themselves <laughs> that is probably just, yeah, you don't get the missile button. But everything else <laughs> is just there, right? And um, I think that's where a number of the more um, um, forward-looking OEMs are going. Yeah, yeah. You did mention smart device link as well. Okay. But to add to Dan's point, um, to add to Dan's point, some of the OEMs, like Ford, for instance, had something called AppLink, which they've now uh, rebranded as um, Smart Device Link, and they pushed that out as a standard. And that's one step in the right direction to try to standardize an interface to the head unit, for instance. So I could have an application on my smartphone actually more push data than the UI. In fact, the UI is already determined by a framework that they have. So you essentially are pushing data from the smartphone into the head unit, and then they're going to represent it in a driver-safe way. So that's a, a first step, which is very interesting. We'll see what kind of traction that it gets. OK, anybody else? Two more. Yeah, you guys have the master of the universe, the Cunix universe here now. So <laughs> he, know, he knows it all far more than I do. So we're lucky to have him. Hello. You mentioned the lifetime of uh, the cars compared to smartphones and things like that. I guess I've seen from Arman, but I'm not sure of the brand. Uh, an initiative that uh, allows to um, update the hardware in the car. 
because what I think is uh, it can really slow down uh, um, the apps if the hardware doesn't follow. And I've seen, I don't know if it's Harman, but I, I, I think it's, 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 it's that. Um, in a Mercedes, you can uh, withdraw the computer, the infotainment mm -hmm. system, and renew it. So that when they resell the car uh, in the aftermarket, they can resell a car which is brand new, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see in the market any other initiative like, like that to, to enable to switch the hardware very easily? I know that a lot of the OEMs are trying to modularize their design. I don't know if any of them are as far along as being able to do that. Like I, I was going to give you one example, though, of... Um, I think it was one of our customers, and I think it was Mercedes, had just released a brand new car, like basically around the same time as, you know, when Apple came out, was it the iPhone 4 and they changed all of the adapters of how you connect how you connect things in the car and to the phone like they had just basically they had just shipped a brand new car with that kind of um plug the old kind of uh, iPod connector in it and um that you're basically um, anyways I don't know Dan do you know many people b doing modular hardware platforms <laughs> yes are um, lots of them doing it or so um yeah a number of them I'd say Audi was the first and what they've done is they've actually built sort of there's a base processor in there. It's a TI automotive part. And it does a lot of stuff down at the CAN bus. It doesn't change a lot, right? But then they have an NVIDIA plug-in module that snaps in. Yep. And it provides all the advanced multimedia. And the idea is that these little modules, you just can snap a new one in. But, so who, but can an individual do that or the dealership does that? The dealership like, can yeah. do that. So the idea is that they've actually recognized that there's the part of the system mm -hmm. that's all safety critical, you don't want to change very much, is all certified. And then there's the part that is, you know, more, more, more like a smartphone. And uh, they actually have two computing platforms. Mm -hmm. And they actually connect them in a distributed environment using our message passing, Kinex distributed through using PCI Express to connect the two processors together. And um, so they were one of the first to recognize yeah. that you could upgrade a car like that. Yeah, they but were the I'd say a number of others of. are doing the exact same thing, separating yeah. the, the stuff that changes a lot from sort of the base can, because you're not going to rewire your CAN bus. It's not changing. Any other questions? Oh, there's one. Uh, in terms of security and um, driver distraction, how far do you think uh, are OEMs willing to integrate uh, assistance systems, telemetry, and so on with your platform? You're only talking about infotainment as, as of now. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in uh, the autonomous driving stuff. So how far do you think or how willing are the OEMs to uh, take a step forward well, into integrating? Yeah, I think autonomous driving is a little bit further out. Um, they all have research going on in that area, but the ADAS uh, um, autom automatic, I never get the driver assist, automated driver assist systems. Yeah, yeah. Um, though, though, those are going on right now. And we're actually involved in a number of uh, design wins in that area. Um, I, I actually had a slide, but I took it out because it didn't really relate to this um, as much. Because they, But they're definitely building um, like s lane departure warnings and cameras all over the car and all that kind of stuff. And automatic braking, automatic braking yeah. And we have, um, that's where we, our safety certifications, um, ISO 2000, Nine two six two six two, <laughs> two, six, two, six, two. Um, certification is really important in that um, domain. So so yes, I think they're all working on ADAS today, and autonomous vehicles are definitely the part of their future. Although I worry, if you're a BMW, what you know, autonomous driving is actually going to do to drive right? So on the one hand, they're all doing it, but on the other hand, there are these performance cars where Now, I know that they are doing uh, research. Mm -hmm. um, I'm involved in that. But how uh, far do you think are the OEMs going to integrate uh, all of the systems? 
I, I know uh, I know about so the research. Uh, so, so, the yeah, for instance, yeah. that you can can build app, uh, an app for that. Oh, so that that as a developer, you'd be able to access the car like the APIs and things like that. Um, I think it would be great <laughs> if we could, if 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 they found a way to do that. Um, I know that one of the big issues right now is it's two pieces. It's who owns the data in the car that like does the driver own it? Does the OEM own it? And then there's also the aspect of um, um, privacy. So one of the things we talk to people about is whether there's a way of crowdsourcing the data and making or um, sort of arbitrating whose data it is and, and then making it available. But I, I'm not sure, I can't speak to what the OEMs are doing with that right now. I don't, I don't know, Dan, if you had anything to add on that, like how? So if you're talking about information that's on the CAN bus itself, our architecture, we actually have a, um, a set of published publish subscribe points where, in fact, um, you would be able to see everything happening in the vehicle bus just as a bunch of objects that would be changing. Whenever they change, you can subscribe to them. You'll get a notification. And in fact, we've done a, a, a QT um, class for that. So in fact, you could plug in and express an interest in a whole set of uh, variables that would be present in the car. The only thing is the OEM could decide to lock those down such that they were not available to a third party app. And again, that would be done in an OEM by OEM basis. Um, for the most part, I don't see, see why they would have any reason to stop it other than things like location, because then they might worry that an app could track you, right? And so it really comes down to, you know, what information might they block for privacy reasons? Or they may not want you to see their sensors because maybe somebody could start predicting, you know, problems with a particular car by monitoring what's going on. But mm -hmm. it'll be in an OEM by OEM basis. But our mm -hmm. architecture, by definition, provides all that in, at, in an like abstracted hooks, way yeah. such that you could see it. So if the OEM doesn't stop us, it will be there. Okay, I think I we need to done. break now because yeah. some other people might want to get in here for the next yeah. speech. And some people who are here, although unlikely, might want to be somewhere else in the next speech. So thank you very much for Linda and for the assistance of Dan. Thank you, thank you everybody.